Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights. We had uh, sort of a rock triple feature, not not super metal, although I feel content-wise these films were pretty, uh, pretty metal, you know? Starting off with the film Streets of Fire, which is sort of, uh, like retro futurist movie, or maybe like retro presentist movie. I think it's set in the 80s, but it's set in a very 1950s style 1980s. The the lead singer of this rock band gets kidnapped by some bikers, and her old boyfriend, who's like gone off to the military and become like this big war hero, uh, is hired by her current boyfriend and manager, played by Rick Moranis, uh, to, to go rescue her. Uh, and he, he recruits a girl he met at a bar who was also in the army. And uh, he brings Rick Moranis along with him. And they, they go rescue her. And then they've got to, like, get back to their hometown without these bikers fucking killing them. And they're also sort of on the run from the police... Uh, because the, the, the bikers who kidnapped them kind of bought out the police a little bit. Uh, hijinks ensue. They, they hijack a bus with a, a doo-wop group in it. <laughs> um, it's just, it's a wild, crazy movie. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I, I do... I do worry people might misinterpret the film because in a lot of ways it is not technically good. The acting is pretty cheesy, but it's clearly very deliberately cheesy. It's not a realistic movie. It's a movie that takes place in sort of its own little world, you know? Like I said, it's like... I think it's set in the 80s, but it's a very 1950s style 80s, right? It's it's what the 50s would have thought the 80s looked like. Qu quite a cast in this movie, and a lot of them before they were really super famous. Um, Rick Moranis is in this, and this was 84, so this would have been like the same year as Ghostbusters. Um, Willem Dafoe is in it. He's like the head of the biker gang. He and the lead character get into this, like, crazy hammer fight at the end of the movie. They both have these, like, giant hammers, and they're just swinging hammers at each other. And it's like, well, it's, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a movie where they fight with giant hammers. <laughs> you know, usually it's, like, swords or something, but nah, nah, fuck that. Hammers. Um, Diane Lane is the singer... Um, and, oh, um, fucking Bill Paxton is in the movie. He's, uh, he's not on a lot of it. He's a bartender in, like, the hometown. And he, he comes out at the end of the, because, you know, of course, they, they get the singer home, but then all the bikers show up in the hometown, and they're like, hey, we want to fight, uh, the lead dude. What is the lead dude's name, actually? Hold on. <laughs> Tom Cody. Tom Cody, the main guy. They're like, oh, we want to fight Cody. Bring out Cody and we'll, we'll spare the rest of the town. But then, like, the whole town comes out to back Cody as he hammer fights Willem Dafoe. <laughs> D directed by Walter Hill, the man behind The Warriors, which is a great movie. Also, uh, 48 Hours... The, uh, Nick Nolte, Eddie Murphy movie. Um, not a huge fan of 48 Hours, but The Warriors I love, and Streets of Fire I love, because it's just, it's, it's wild. It's, <laughs> it's over the top, but it's over the top in entirely unique ways, like, way, ways you wouldn't really expect, you know? Like, you think, like, oh, this is like a wild sort of futuristic rock and roll movie. So there's some expectation of, like, the weird things that are going to happen. But it's not really that at all. It's just... I don't... It's, it's like... 
It's it's a very 1950s idea of a wild, crazy movie. But, like, it, it delivers in a way a lot of movies from the 50s would not. I think a lot of movies from the 50s would stop short of how crazy Streets of Fire is. So, I, I appreciate a film that can sort of go, Hey, what if this style of movie from the past, but we really committed to the bit because we can get away with a lot more now, right? You couldn't get away with shit in the 50s. This came out in the 80s. You could do whatever you want in the 80s. I mean, a, a lot of car wrecks, actually. Um, that's the, one of the more obvious things. And a, a lot of things catching fire. It is called Streets of Fire for a reason. Because there's a lot of fucking fire in this movie. Uh, for a movie with Rick Moranis in it, the the ending is a little space ballsy, because uh, you know he's he's been hired. Uh, Cody has been hired to like rescue this ex girlfriend of his, and there's a lot of money in it for him. But then you know the ending comes, and oh, he doesn't take the money because he's like, oh, I just wanted to rescue her, um, which <laughs> I don't know. It feels cheesy but the whole movie is really cheesy and but but the whole movie is also very original and that's a very cliche way to be cheesy so mm, i'm willing to give it a pass because it's it's not out of character for the movie but it is a pretty dull way to end the movie i don't know it's just it's a very fun movie i really enjoy streets of fire <laughs> Very nice Shout Select release. Um, I'm not really sure what the difference between Shout Select and the normal stuff Shout Factory puts out is. Because they do, they have put out some artsier stuff on the Shout Select label. They put out Adaptation, my fucking favorite movie, which was not on Blu-ray until like last year. Like last year, on my birthday, it dropped on my birthday. They released Adaptation on Shout Select. So there are some more dramatic ones in here. But this is like a wild, crazy cult movie that I feel like Shout Factory could have just released on their normal label. I don't know what makes this a Shout Select version. Unless it's just a movie the people at Shout Factory really liked. Which, fair. It's a really good movie. I really enjoy this one. I believe all three of these are streaming... Not not all on the same service, but I, some of them are on Tubi. I believe this is on Tubi. If, no, this is on Netflix. I believe this is on Netflix. I'm, I'm almost certain this is on Netflix. The other two are on Tubi. Anyways, Streets of Fire, please watch this. After that, we watched Savage Streets. A uh, Linda Blair starring feature. A Linda Blair vehicle. Um... This one, honestly, didn't even have, like, rock music in it at all. There were some punks in it. And, you know, it, I, I would argue this is a pretty metal movie, you know. You got Linda Blair, like, running around in a leather jacket, killing motherfuckers. So that's, that's worth something. But there's not a lot of music to this movie. So that's kind of on me, I guess. All three of these films are from 1984. And uh, Buckaroo Banzai and Streets of Fire are very similar movies. And th this is Streets of Fire, and this is Savage Streets. So that was kind of my thinking. I hadn't seen this movie before, but I did want to, so... Th this is, of course, unfortunately, a rape-revenge film. Um, I have said before, there's just a blanket content warning on everything I talk about on this show. Like, Matt's Funtime Weird Movie Show, I try to, like... Okay, hey, this one's got some sensitive stuff in it. Uh, this show, if you're sensitive to, like, anything, you probably should not be watching the movies I recommend. Um, or th at the very least, at the very least, check IMDb. Make sure, like, go to the parent section. Make sure there's nothing in there that's gonna bother you. So, Linda Blair's sister is... Deaf? Maybe mute, but I believe deaf. No, yeah, no, yes, deaf. Because there's a point in the movie where someone's yelling for her and they're like, she's deaf, you idiot. 
her sister is deaf, and she gets raped by this gang of punks, and then these punks also kill one of her other friends. Uh, so she she wants revenge on this, like, gang of punks that raped her sister and killed her friend. And I guess it's nice that it is at least a female-led rape revenge movie, but it still has a lot of the issues I have with other rape revenge films. Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, I Spit on Your Grave, because it's got, like, a, it's got a fucking 20-minute rape scene, and that's just excessive. You cannot do 20 minutes of rape. That is too much. You have gone too far. But... Outside of that, I, I think the, the rape scene is excessive, but outside of that, I think it's one of the better rape revenge movies because, number one, it is absurdly violent. Like, the revenge is really fucking good. If you're gonna go so far as to have rape in a movie, you better justify it with some hard fucking violence. This better, better be, like, the most violent shit I have ever seen. And I spit on your grave delivers. Number two, the person getting the revenge is actually the person who got raped. I hate that so much about rape revenge films. It's it's never the person who was raped getting the revenge. You know, you, you got like Death Wish or uh, Savage Streets. <laughs> you know, so many of these rape revenge films, it's like, oh, my wife or daughter or sister was raped, now I'm going to get revenge. And it's like, why can't the person who got raped get revenge? That's who I want to see get revenge. So, like, as much as I, I, I find the excessively long rape scene in I Spit on Your Grave excessive and unnecessary, but I do think outside of that it is one of the better rape revenge films because it actually fucking delivers what I want out of a rape revenge film. This film, the violence is not bad, although there's there, there's five members of this punk gang, and one of them is actually like a nice guy, and he like he hates the gang, and he's the one who like tells Linda Blair who it was. And then she goes and kills three of the other members, and I'm like, isn't there still one guy left? Like, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I miscounted. Maybe, maybe I thought the, the good punk was still a member, but I, I think she missed one of them. I think one of them just doesn't die. I might be wrong about that. But yeah, the, the violence is decent, but it's like... I don't know, I would have liked to seen more violence... I would have liked her to kill more people. <laughs> Another rape revenge film worth mentioning, Miss 45, because that is the person who got raped getting revenge, and she kills, like, so many people. But, of course, that one sort of derails to the point of, like, the, the woman becomes utterly deranged. I don't know. I kind of like Miss 45, but I don't. I don't think it is a pure rape revenge film because there is more going on than just rape revenge but it's a, it's, it's a good movie i enjoy it um uh, of course stars the 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 lovely and infamous linda blair most famous for playing the girl from the exorcist although uh, it seems like a lot of that performance was done by someone else. Like, she she was the girl. She was the one in the makeup and all that. But the voice through a lot of it was someone else. Um, so she, she can't take full credit for The Exorcist. And she became pretty infamous after that as, like, not a particularly good actress. And I, I think that's maybe unfair. She is... She's fine. But she ended up in a lot of, like, low-grade cult movies after that. Uh, this. The Exorcist 2. Uh, Roller Boogie. <laughs> oh, man, fuck. There's definitely other Linda Blair movies I've seen that I kind of enjoyed her in. 
Uh, she was in Hell Knight. Uh, Hell Knight's fine. It's a decent little horror movie. There is there there's like a really good moment in it near the end. Uh, but I enjoyed it. She she ended up in a lot of stuff like that at like Savage Streets, which is like yeah, weird cult movie. She spends a bit of time, more more than one scene in this movie, topless, and uh, a, a, apparently she did like whole spreads for like Playboy and shit. Uh, she she was topless a whole lot, and it's it's real weird to say like oh yeah, you want to see like the kid from The Exorcist topless. But man, Linda Blair was fucking hot. <laughs> it's, 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 I call him as I see him. Linda Blair was hot. You know, not in The Exorcist. She was way too young in The Exorcist. But in The Exorcist 2, I remember watching The Exorcist 2 and I'm like, damn, Linda Blair grew up really hot, didn't she? Apparently I wasn't the only one who thought that. <laughs> Google, for some reason, has listed her in Exorcist 2 before Exorcist. Known for Exorcist to the Heretic, The Exorcist. Hmm. She does definitely have more of a role in Exorcist 2. I'm 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 gonna have to talk about Exorcist 2 someday. Probably on Hollow Victories. Look for a, an Exorcist 2 episode of Hollow Victories. We'll pair it up with like uh it's, it's Highlander 2. That'd be a good pair up. So this Blu-ray from uh Code Red releasing, which I believe is owned and operated by David DeFalco, the writer and director of Heavy Metal Massacre. So this is David DeFalco's uh, boutique line. I think this is the first Code Red Blu-ray I've shown off. Um, so that that's a boutique distributor I haven't talked about before. There you go, because even Shout Select I've talked about before. <laughs> Code Red, I talked about a Code Red movie. Yeah, Savage Streets, it's... it's fun, it's okay, but... I don't know, it's not great. Finally, we've got Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. This is the story of Buckaroo Banzai, the man who does fucking everything. He is a heart surgeon, a physicist, and a rock star. <laughs> um, and I think maybe one or two other things as well, but at, those are the three things we see him doing in this movie. Uh, he invents a machine that can, like, travel through dimensions. Um, <laughs> it's, it's weirdly Back to the Future. But this came out in 84, the same year as Back to the Future. And this also features Christopher Lloyd, so... <laughs> but yeah, he, he has this car, and if he drives fast enough, he can, like, go through solid objects because it takes him through, like, an alternate dimension. But in going through an alternate dimension, he accidentally releases uh, a bunch of, like, weird alien creatures who were trapped there by the people of their home planet for being evil, right? It's it's sort of, yeah, like the beginning of Superman 2 when Zod gets released from his prison. It's like that. So, like, these, these aliens show up and tell Buckaroo Banzai, like, hey, you've released some of our most dangerous criminals from the eighth dimension, and we need your help to stop them. So he's like, yeah, okay, I will help stop them. Also, there's so many fucking movies I could compare this to, but there's a, there's also a bit of they live to it because after he goes through the eighth dimension, uh, motherfuckers mowing right out. It's fucking. How do they do it? How do they always know when I'm recording? God damn. And they always wait till I'm like deep in the recording. It's not like I sit down to record and it's like, oh, they're already mowing. No, they wait till I'm recording, like, halfway through the video, and then they'll start mowing. Anyways, uh, after he goes through the 8th dimension, Buckaroo Banzai can see the alien people, but everyone else just sees them as humans. I even think there's special glasses they make so that they can see the aliens. I might be wrong about that. I might be misremembering a scene. They definitely put on, like, special glasses to see something special. Stars... 
Peter Weller uh, as Buckaroo Banzai, who would go on to play RoboCop, the RoboCop as Buckaroo Banzai, uh, also features um, John Lithgow as the villain, and man, I fucking love John Lithgow. <laughs> John Lithgow is such an underrated actor. He's in so many good things. He's so good. He's Lord Farquaad in Shrek. I always forget that he's Farquaad in Shrek, and then I'll I'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, man, John Lithgow's so good, and then I'll be like, oh yeah, oh, he was he was Lord Farquaad. Forgot about that one. But he's he's great in this. He's great in uh, Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, this is another one that has a lot of actors that would go on to be pretty famous. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is in the movie. He's he's like a cowboy for some reason, but he never like acts like a cowboy. He's just dressed like a cowboy. Uh, and then you got Clancy Brown, the voice of Mr. Krabs in this movie. Um, Christopher Lloyd's in the movie. It's like er excellent casting. Everyone I think is great in this movie because. They're all, like, real fucking weird, and this movie's real fucking weird. This movie has grown, like, quite a bit of a cult following, but upon its release, people didn't really- the, the studio didn't really know how to market it, and they, they didn't push it very well, and, and it flopped hard. So at the end of the movie, they're like, Oh, Buckaroo Banzai will return! And he never did. There was never a sequel to this. Uh, unfortunately, because I would have loved to have seen a sequel to this. It's just, it's a really funny movie. It's just like a weird... I don't know, it's like a sci-fi throwback, but then it's also like so many unique things that are just like nothing else. And it's it's just, it's a brilliant movie. It's It's so weird, it's so unique and original. That's what I love about this movie, man. It is absolutely unique. It is absolutely its own thing. There is nothing like it. Even though I've compared it to, like, six different movies, you would have to. It's, it's like... Like, it's similar to, like, six different movies, but it is still completely different from any one of those. This is another Shout Select Blu-ray. Spine number one. Again... No idea what separates this from the normal cult stuff they release, but, you know, if you're gonna do, like, a special release of something, Buckaroo Banzai, this movie is great. I adore this movie. Um, it's grown quite a cult following. The, a lot of people really love it now. The John Larroquette Show. The John Larroquette Show referenced this a lot. Uh, the, there's a company in the movie that's run by, like, the, the John Lithgow villain. Not an alien, I think. I don't, I don't think he's an alien, but he's working with the aliens. I, I only say I think he's not an alien because there are scenes where everyone has, like, the alien faces and John Lithgow is just always John Lithgow. But uh, on the John Larroquette show, they reference Yo-Yo Dine Industries, which is the, the villain's company from this movie. Um, so, John Larroquette. Big fan of uh, Buckaroo Banzai. A lot of people are big fans of Buckaroo Banzai. It's, it's grown quite an audience. And that audience should include you. Watch Buckaroo Banzai. It is amazing. I love it. This is one of the most unique movies ever made. I, I love it to death. So last time I asked you, what's a movie you like that got totally screwed by the studio? Uh, John August says two movies that I adore that got screwed over, Titan AE and Treasure Planet. Both got shafted because of marketing, and Treasure got further screwed by releasing against Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Oof. Um, Treasure Planet I have seen, and I, I, I enjoyed it pretty well. It's certainly a unique movie, and from what I understand, um, something the directors were trying to get off the ground for a long, long time, and... Disney's just like, uh, we'd rather you made these other movies for us. Can can you make Beauty and the Beast? Can you can you make Hercules? If these if if Hercules works out, then sure you can do your Treasure Planet thing, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that that was 
the Treasure Planet is definitely an unfortunate story. Titan AE, I am not familiar with. I have definitely heard the title before, but I, I know nothing about the movie. So I, I could not speak to either the film or the controversy behind it. But uh, it's, for, it, it's an animated movie, right? It's a weird like sci-fi animated movie, and I, I totally could see that just the studio just not knowing what to do with that. Lino says, the 1997 French film Doberman with Vincent Castle totally disappeared, which is a shame because it's a wild ride. I've definitely heard of Doberman, possibly from Lino. I think Lino was the one who mentioned it. It might have, like, dropped off the map, but you can still find it. Um, I haven't, I haven't watched it, but... I look, I look forward to it. I probably will eventually. For me, I would have to say Under the Silver Lake. Um, it was from the director of It Follows. I liked It Follows, but I feel like the concept sort of fell apart for me. Like, the, the sexually transmitted ghost. It just seemed like a silly concept, and it didn't even seem like metaphorical for STDs. Because once you give someone else the ghost, you don't have the ghost anymore. So it's like, this this doesn't work as a metaphor. But it's also such a silly concept that it, it like needs to be a metaphor. Or else this needs to be more of a comedy movie. But I, I did really enjoy the writing and directing on that movie. So I'm like, I look forward to whatever this guy does next. And then he makes Under the Silver Lake. And I'm like, alright, I'm hyped for this. And then they push it back from like April to December. And I'm like... Fine, okay, it'll be out during, like, Oscar season. And then they push it back from December to April. And I'm like, God, you've pushed my movie back an entire fucking year. And then they, they barely gave it a theatrical release. They just dumped it on the VOD. And it was my favorite movie of the year. It's, it's a fucking amazing movie. I love Under the Silver Lake. Please watch Under the Silver Lake. I mean, I kind of get why they couldn't promote it that well because it is a really weird movie but on the other hand i think there's an audience for it. i think there has been an audience for it like people have discovered it there's like huge discussions about it online because it leaves a lot to be discussed it is a movie you can watch over and over and constantly find new things in it that's maybe a bit of an ironic pick because that, that's an a24 release and uh, our first movie tonight is also an A24 release. But uh, before we get into that, I guess my, my question this week, I guess, will be... What is your favorite punk rock movie? We've talked about metal, but our, our first film tonight is a lot more punk than it is metal. So, what's your favorite punk rock movie? So we are starting, in case I haven't given it away already, we're starting with Green Room. <laughs> um, the violent, like, horror thriller from uh, pretty recently, 2016? 2016, 2016. Following that, we've got uh, Richard Stanley's Hardware. And then finally, this is really stretching the definition of a metal movie, but... There's a commercial in this movie for, like, a heavy metal CD, and then at some point, someone calls in and yells, Ah, oh, Judas Priest rules! Maybe Iron Maiden rules. I forget if it's Iron Maiden or Judas Priest. But they, they shout out the name of a metal band. It's the WNUF Halloween special. Fuck you, it's my show. I'll show whatever I want. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Matt. Have a nice day.